All right. It is noon here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which means it's time to say good afternoon for those of you on our time zone or good evening uh, to those of you who I'm seeing coming in from other parts of the world, perhaps good morning to others. And welcome to this edition of PON Live from the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. I'm Nicole Bryant, the Managing Director here at PON, and as ever, it is a great pleasure to welcome all of our participants uh, from all across the globe uh, to today's discussion with Professor Lawrence Suskind uh, of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Larry is uh, the Ford Professor of Urban and Environmental Planning at MIT, the Director of the MIT Cybersecurity Clinic, and the Vice Chair of Pedagogy right here at the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. Um, before we turn to Larry's talk, uh, just a couple of words about uh, our format for today. So Larry is going to be speaking on cyber negotiations, the case of ransomware uh, for about 40 minutes or so. And during that time, of course, if any of our uh, participants have comments, please feel free to write them in the chat. And if you start to think of questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. After about 40 minutes, Larry's going to open up uh, to the Q&A portion of this session. He's going to be selecting uh, questions and hoping to get to the maximum number in the 20 remaining minutes of our discussion. Uh, but he has very graciously offered to uh, respond to any additional questions that we don't have time to discuss live. And we will post the answers to those questions on our events page uh, once he's had time to write them out after the session. So we thank him for that generous offer. I'd also, of course, and as ever, like to thank the wonderful PON staff for all of their work preparing and supporting this event today. Our uh, events coordinator, Diane Long, our program assistant, Billy Fairfield, and PON's assistant director, James Kerwin. So thanks to all of them. And thanks as ever to our great group uh, of participants and members of our PON community for being with us. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to hand over the virtual Zoom microphone to Larry Suskind. Thanks so much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm sure there may be some of you in the audience that I know. So hello to those that I already know. Um, as some of you know, I teach a course called uh, Cybersecurity for Critical Urban Infrastructure. Uh, it's been offered for five years through edX and now MITx. Uh, you, if you're interested in these questions from today, you may want to look at that uh, five-week uh, online course that's available. Um, I'm also the co-director of something called the Consortium of University-Based Cybersecurity Clinics. Based on the Cybersecurity Clinic at MIT, uh, there are now 16 universities in four countries that have created uh, similar clinics. Uh, we welcome other university-based groups that do clinical education in cybersecurity, meaning they have students work with uh, different uh, cities or towns or not-for-profits or small businesses uh, to assist them in uh, preparing for or avoiding a cyber attack. Um, so uh, there's more you can look at to follow up and you'll see at the end of the day uh, end of my talk today, uh, some uh, websites that uh, will give you more information about the work that uh, my teams are doing and that the clinic and the cybersecurity consortium is doing. And um, I would be delighted to be in touch with any of those working in this field uh, who want to be in touch. So um, I'm going to show you a short video summarizing the work that our team has been doing. And for those that come from the negotiation field and don't have a lot of background in the cyber side, uh, this uh, short video will frame the question that I'm gonna be talking about. What happens when our critical urban infrastructure is compromised with a cyber attack? How do we defend the smart city technologies that we have become reliant upon for our basic everyday functions? Can we utilize social engineering as a form of cyber defense? When we think of the cyber world, security professionals focus their solutions around technical tools, such as intrusion detection systems or firewalls. But cyber attacks are not limited to technical tools, 
cyber criminals are leveraging social engineering, highly effective non-technical techniques to manipulate individuals and their data as a means of access to target systems. If attackers are using these non-technical tools so effectively, could the same social engineering in coordination with technical tools be used to enhance our ability to defend against cyber attacks? We are developing a defensive social engineering toolbox to defend against cyber attacks and one of these tools is cyber negotiation. Let's use a cultural touchstone, a hostage negotiation situation, to explain how cyber negotiation is different than the physical world negotiation. In a classic hostage situation, we have an attacker, the hostage taker, the hostage, and the negotiator. If we use this model for a cyber attack, we also have an attacker, a hostage, and a negotiator. But who, or what, fills these roles means we need to rethink our entire strategy. In the cyber attack, our hostage is often data or a system, not a person. Does the ability to have backup copies of these digital artifacts change how we value their importance? Does the risk of affecting entire urban populations, instead of a finite number of hostages, alter how we balance costs and benefits? Even more complex, our concept of an attacker is changed. Are we dealing with a human with agency, a bot controlled by a human, or an autonomous bit of code that is predestined for an outcome despite any of our attempts to engage with it? What is the objective of the cyber attack? Money? Information? Terrorism? How do all these ambiguities give us any room to build a strategy for negotiating successfully? Social cyber defense of urban critical infrastructure, incorporating social engineering into a cyber defense playbook. Through development of a database detailing documented successful cyber attacks, examination of the characteristics of these attacks, and simulated cyber attacks with operational managers, we are building a dynamic toolbox that will rapidly respond to the evolving field of cyber defense. This $99 smart drone is disrupting the entire photography industry. Well, no, I'm not selling drones. I don't know where that came from. Um, but let us uh, turn to the first slide. Um, what do we know about cyber attacks on public agencies? Who are the attackers and what do they want? Um, sometimes when public agencies are attacked, the last thing they want to do is let anybody know that they've been attacked. Uh, many public officials are uh, embarrassed that they were attacked. They somehow feel the public will decide it's their fault and that their political uh, future will be somehow in jeopardy. So uh, we don't really know about all the cyber attacks on public agencies in the United States. In Europe, uh, there's a duty to report. It's illegal not to report to the EU appropriate entity if you've been attacked. Not in the US, there's no obligation to report. What we can tell, from what we can tell, from what we hear, from what the FBI and Homeland knows, uh, there are probably more than a thousand attacks a day on public entities of various kinds. These are not mostly successful, but they are attacks of some sort of a um, hacker trying to break into the system. Um, most of the attacks are not homegrown. Most of the attacks uh, come from uh, out of the country, particularly from entities, not the states themselves, but from entities in China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Um, these attackers are in it for the money. While there may be a side benefit from their standpoint of uh, creating chaos uh, in the places where they are attacking, this is a very lucrative business, particularly with regard to what I want to talk about, which is ransomware. So an attacker finds a way into a public agency's information systems um, and releases malware and that malware uh, releases ransomware. Um, you can, if you are familiar with the dark web and are willing to pay a small amount, buy a kit that you can use to learn how to launch a ransomware attack on an unsuspecting uh, public utility of some kind. Um, the attackers appear often 
to, as a business, invest in creating uh, automated attacks through bots of various kinds that just take large numbers of addresses from the dark web that they buy and keep sending attack communications. This is nothing more than an email with an attachment. And any agency has to worry that any person working for that agency would say, oh, I wonder who that email's from. I don't recognize them. They open the email, there's an attachment. They open the attachment, ransomware is released. And at that point, all of the data could be captured, that is encrypted by the attacker. And the next thing that happens is all the screens in that entity, in that agency go dark. And then a message comes up. You've seen it in, already in the movies. You've seen it on TV shows. It's a plot line that has been played out now multiple times in the last year or two. And the message says, you have to pay this much in Bitcoin by this time, tomorrow night, or you'll never see your data again, meaning we'll never give you the decryption key you need to recapture and reuse your data. The amount in ransom is going up. So the attackers want money. And they say, pay this much in Bitcoin. That's equal to an amount of money. And uh, if you don't pay it by this time, you'll never get control of your data again. Next slide, please. So cities know this is coming. It's not a surprise. Every city agency, every city is a potential target. And so the question is, how can we help cities, particularly those responsible for critical infrastructure that we all depend on day in and day out and that all private business depends on day in and day out? What can we do to help them assess and reduce their vulnerabilities? That is what the work of the MIT Cybersecurity Clinic is focusing on. It is a clinic. Students work with public agencies uh, for a semester and they undertake an assessment and we have built a 22 question assessment out of many, many hundreds of possible questions a city could be asking to determine its vulnerability to attack. And students work with that agency for a semester to answer those questions. And if the answers are adequate, we can check you, you're covered, you're okay. You don't have to worry about that bit of vulnerability. And if the what students find is it's not adequate, we check that. And then we say, here are some things you might wanna think about doing because from our standpoint, what we saw, what we found when we work with you, look through all of your systems, on a confidential basis, which students have to agree to, and which MIT has agreed to, we found that you're not doing stuff you're supposed to do. It's not as if there are any standards that have been set by federal or state law. There are none. So cities decide what to do or not to do. Counties, states, the federal government does have more explicit guidelines, particularly for defense-related activity and for any contractors that who would work, who would hope to work for the Defense Department or on any um, infrastructure uh, where defense is involved, uh, they have very explicit cybersecurity standards that those agencies or organizations must meet. But there are no standards for cities or states to meet with regard to cybersecurity, uh, those of us working in this field hopeful, hope that will come soon. Um, so there is a set of questions city can cities can answer 
to try to reduce their vulnerability to attack. Some very, very simple things. Have you installed the patches that software vendors who've sold you software have subsequently sent around because they turned out to be a point of vulnerability? And so now a patch is provided for free. And we ask, do you have someone who pays attention to these patches and installs them? That's the kind of question we would ask. And if we find that cities offer no training to all their employees about what not to open and what might release ransomware, then we say your training for all new hires is inadequate. Um, this, there's all kinds of training available uh, that cities can choose to provide, um, but we found in many instances, there is no systematic training and retraining uh, that goes on. Uh, we ask, do you have an incident response plan? If you are attacked, if you think about being attacked, is there someone who will be responsible for shutting down your systems before ransomware can make its way through the whole system? And cities should have not only an incident response plan, but they should be rehearsing it at least once, hopefully more often. And this is what we would call defensive social engineering. It's not about buying a gizmo to attach to your computer system to protect it. It's all about how the people that work in the organization and how the organization or the agency operates um, that determines its vulnerability to cyber attack through ransomware, malware releases that people gain through phishing and other kinds of efforts to manipulate people in public agencies. Uh, next slide, please. So Baltimore was attacked and the demand, the ransom demand was for uh, $80,000. And the city asked the FBI in real time, should we pay this ransom? And the FBI said, what it says when, when, when there are attacks and hostage takings involving humans, uh, don't pay the ransom. That will just encourage the ransom takers to attack more people. Uh, so Baltimore did not pay the $80,000. It subsequently, and, and they lost control of all the city's financial and real estate data. And it took them months to restore the data because they did not have real-time backups for all their data. They did not have cloud-based backups for all their data. And so they had to reconstruct the data with help from outside vendors who came and helped them rebuild it. It cost the, six, the city $12 million to restore the data that they lost because they wouldn't pay $80,000. Um, after several years of uh, people in this world writing about it, the FBI now says, um, you need to have a plan to decide whether or not you're going to pay ransom, and if so, how much. That plan might include an analysis of what is your most important data? What are the risks associated with losing particular kinds of data or control of different systems? What would it cost you to recreate those? So you need to do a risk assessment. This is one of the things students at MIT in the clinic and in the other clinics around the country are helping public agencies do. Understand what data you can't afford to lose. Understand the importance of paying to create some system. It may not be seamless, but some system of producing copies of important data so that if something is taken or lost, 
you can still have a way of switching to another version of that system and continuing crucial operations. Um, I will tell you, having uh, studied what's gone on with the great many cities uh, that don't have systems for recording their information on a regular basis, they don't have a plan about whether they will or won't pay ransom so that when it happens, everybody runs in every direction because they have no incident response plan. They don't know who is responsible. The IT guy isn't necessarily the one who's going to make the city decision about whether to pay. It might be the mayor. Of course, the mayor has no technical capacity on the spot to make a judgment. And nobody has a capacity to make a decision at the moment of attack if they haven't thought about it beforehand, if they haven't assessed which data they can afford to lose or which data they can afford to lose, they're not going to have real-time copies of or some way of recreating. So should cities pay ransom when attackers demand it? I would say, uh, yeah, pay the ransom if it's way, way less than what it's going to cost you to restore or recreate the data that you've lost control of. Um, in some sense, uh, to be snarky about it, you could consider the ransom a stupid fee for not having done the necessary preparation beforehand. Now, this is what the cost is. Now, will you go back, please, and go through the 23 questions that we use or go through the 430 questions that the federal government uh, NIST uses, National Institute for uh, Standards, um, and do your homework, do the preparation that you need to do. Next slide, please. Now, in real time, assume you're attacked. Uh, it's very unlikely anyone's going to track down those attackers later. I promise you that several branches of the U.S. government have devoted lots of time and energy to trying to track down the black hats that have attacked particularly uh, large private interests in the United States, corporate interests. Um, they haven't. They're not able to. It's The hackers know how to hide. They know how to maintain their anonymity. So you could say, well, how's it possible to negotiate then? Well, you know that you're getting a demand to pay a ransom. It tells you the address you're supposed to send that amount of money or a Bitcoin by a certain time. You could send a message and say, we don't have $80,000. We only have 50. If we send you the 50 by five o'clock this afternoon, will you release our data? Will you give us the decryption key? Now, two th things will come to mind. One is, will they answer that? Well, three things will come to mind. Will they answer that? Will they go for it and say, okay, we'll take the $50,000? And the third thing, the most important thing, we'll come to in a second, is, and will they release the data even if they get the money? Now, there are several organizations in uh, other parts of the, of, the, of the world that specialize uh, in this negotiation at that critical moment, and particularly in the European context, people know to call these organizations, these the companies, and these companies will take over this process of conversation uh, on the dark web where the money was supposed to go. And it turns out from what we've been able to find out, although there's not articles about this in the scholarly literature, nobody's reporting what works, what happened. Uh, but from what we've heard via word of mouth, uh, there have been uh, a number of occasions in which uh, an offer to pay less than what was requested uh, did yield uh, an agreement to release the data. From everything that's been published, uh, we can see that 
in more than 95% of the cases of uh, ransomware, the data were returned. Now think about it from a negotiation standpoint. They're in it for the money. If word gets out that when you pay this money, you don't get your data back, nobody's going to pay the money, and the business, the black hat business will fail. So it does turn out that if you pay the ransom, you get your data back. Then you have to invest in checking the data very carefully to see whether perhaps there's some other Trojan horse back in your data that's going to cause you to be attacked subsequently because of something you don't even see or know. So far, it's turned out that the data haven't been contaminated, that again, in more than 95% of the cases, the data have been, the, the, the decryption key has been provided and the data has been, have been returned. So yes, it's possible to negotiate down the amount of a ransom demand. I will say, from everything we've been able to find out, the amount of those demands is going up substantially, public sector and private sector. What might have been a $10,000 demand three years ago is a $100,000 demand. And ransomware is taking slightly different forms now. A university in the Midwest was attacked, but the attack took a different form. There appeared a clock. It said, if you don't pay a certain amount of money, a lot of money, uh, by the time this clock runs out, this is a list of the data that we have our hands on now from your university that we will release. All the salaries of all the people, all the confidential information of all the people in all the records in the university. So it's not just a threat. You won't see the data again. It's quite the opposite. Everybody will see the data if you don't make that payment. And uh, the particular university kept quiet about whether it paid the money, whether it got the data back. Um, I'm sure people on the campus know, uh, but it's not generally reported. So it's possible to negotiate down the amount of a ransom demand. It requires a huge amount of preparation to be ready to intervene, meaning you know who's going to make the decision in your city. You know what the limit is and what you'll pay. You'll know who's going to have Bitcoin available to make a payment. You'll know what offer you might make for what reasons. You'll know what the value is of the data that are at risk. That's a lot of preparation. Next slide, please. We are, I think we can be fairly confident, at least so far, that if the city pays the money, it'll get the data back in a usable form. Um, that's a crucial bit of information. Uh, I can't guarantee that that's always happening because lots of places don't report what happened and the government agencies, FBI, Homeland, um, Secret Service to some extent, um, don't spell out exactly what's happening. Um, and so all I can tell you is from what's been reported, especially by several of the large private cybersecurity firms where they say they've looked at a large number of cases, better than 95% of the time, the data are released. Next slide, please. My sense is that a rather low cost set of moves that cities can take can dramatically reduce the chances of being attacked. Do you have two-factor authentication? Do you change passwords on a regular basis for all your employees? Do you have an annual review of what not to do in terms of unknown people trying to get fishing expeditions to work so that they have access to your computers? Do you 
have an incident response plan in place? Have you rehearsed it? Do you have a playbook for a variety of ways in which things might go that people have gone through? Do you have regular testing of phishing-like events that your consultant is running with your people and you can find out exactly who reports this and who doesn't and who opens the email, this kind of uh, training. Uh, do, should you impose financial uh, penalties on people who keep opening unknown emails and jeopardizing the well-being of the whole city or the whole agency? Um, do you have an idea of where all your machines are? We found so many cities that do not even have an inventory of their hardware and software. Do you patch it on a regular basis? Do you talk to the people who are your third-party vendors or your partners about their cybersecurity? Because it won't do any good, no matter what you do. It won't do you any good if you are connected to other organizations through which an attacker can get to you. So you have to have a very elaborate process of reviewing all third-party vendors and making sure they meet minimum cybersecurity standards. Do If you use cloud services to keep copies of all of your information, there are actually risks associated with operating through one of several uh, existing cloud services. Do you constantly review how those services are being used in your organization? So there are a lot of things that can be done. They do not cost a lot of money. They can reduce the chances of attack. You can prepare so that if you are attacked, you have a strategy in mind about negotiating the ransom. You might have made a decision about buying insurance. There is now cybersecurity insurance, and there's a big question about, is that a good thing or a bad thing? S some people believe that the existence of the insurance and news about it is the reason that the amount of the ransoms has gone up around the world. Oh, they just have their insurance pay it. So what the heck? Let's charge them a lot more. They'll be able to pay it. On the other hand, uh, we finally have cities uh, purchasing cybersecurity insurance that at least will cause them to make sure certain good practices are in effect because the insurance company, at least eventually, doesn't want to keep paying the bill for cities that haven't prepared properly. So you have insurance, you can have a debate, and there have been debates online from the insurance companies and from other uh, organizations about how this insurance works. It turns out in the United States that there's not that many different companies offering this insurance. The insurance has lots of exclusions and it mostly doesn't cover the cost of repair. It might cover the ransom cost or a portion of it, but if you lose control of the data, uh, it can be, as I told you in the Baltimore case, very expensive to uh, fix things. Um, so, I would argue it's better to spend time and money reducing the chances and the cost of uh, being attacked, being attacked by cyber attackers, than to invest a lot of time and energy in trying to calculate your negotiation strategy once you are attacked. Again, you're dealing with bots. Uh, there is no way, as with hostage takers, to say, show me that all my data is okay. Show me for sure that I'm going to get it back before I pay uh, the ransom. That, that's not, there's no analogy. And so uh, while it is possible to uh, engage in this kind of 
uh, attack and response. It's it's it might happen a second time to a city. It might happen a third time. What I see is cities that have been attacked, whether successfully or unsuccessfully, finally putting the time and effort into the preparations that they should put into effect if they want to avoid the chances of being attacked or the value of the loss. If you have off-site copies of all the data that you can seamlessly switch to, you won't have the problem that the British Health Service, the National Health Service had, or that uh, hospitals in Europe had, which is they're attacked, and during the attack, they shut everything down. They shut everything down, and ambulances could not find out what hospital they should take people to who are in the ambulances, and somebody died. In the case of the National Health Service, in the middle of an operation, hospital loses uh, control of its data, and the people, the, the medical professionals doing the work, uh, have no access to the blood bank. And they can't even double check what's the blood type of the person we're operating on. And do we have more of that blood? I mean, the whole operation can be shut down as a way of protecting the agency from further spread of the virus during the attack. And if you have no workaround prepared, the losses could be very substantial. So instead of imagining how you're going to save a percentage of what the amount is requested uh, by the hacker uh, to get the data back, um, put the effort into preparing to reduce the potential value of the loss, because all your very important data are now protected the way they should be. All your very important data are only uh, um, accessible to the smallest number of people with the appropriate training who will take the necessary care to protect those data. Um, so I see some questions. Um, I will try to take uh, uh, as many of them as I can. Um, I There's lots of this in this field that I don't know and don't know about, and I'm going to tell you that. Uh, if the question goes beyond what I can handle. Um, is it common for a hacker to share information once an entity has been attacked in order to escalate the attack with other hackers? Um, it doesn't appear that the uh, attackers are part of a club. Um, they're all in business, and in a sense, they are competitors. Um, can't say it has never happened. Uh, but it's not a, a starting premise that if you're attacked once, you're going to be attacked in the same way uh, by other hackers because they're going to share the information. Um, you could be attacked by the same hacker again, for sure. And that is why you need to do a post-attack careful assessment of what was the route through which they entered. And what are you going to do to shut that down immediately and make sure it stays shut down? Um, how about ransomware and cryptocurrencies? Um, it's mostly a request for payment in Bitcoin. Uh, what they're taking is um, information that I don't think cities would be putting in a blockchain of any kind. So I'm not sure how uh cryptocurrencies would really come into it um uh hostage takers may seek to engage in negotiations under what circumstances do cyber attackers wish to do so um from a very experienced person in this field because i know the name um i don't believe that there's a desire to have any communication if it can be avoided. Uh, I don't think they feel a need to escalate the fear on the part of the uh, agency that's been attacked. 
Um, I, maybe there are certain contexts in the private sector, depending on who's being attacked and what's being asked. But in the public arena, um, there appears to be no desire whatsoever to have any conversation, which is why the only channel seems to be using the address on the dark web where you're supposed to send the payment of the ransom as a place to place a message and see if you can get a response. All I can tell you is that has worked on some occasions. Uh, does your advice to pay ransom as an economic assessment, if it costs less than the restoring, restoring the data, change where the attack, attacker is based in a location that is sanctioned? Uh, I've been told that it is something to take into account when making a decision whether to pay ransom. Um, an interesting question. I don't know what kind of sanctions there might be. Um, my notion is not just about taking the economic cost into account in deciding to pay the ransom. It's taking the damage that the ransom taking will cause, uh, which could include shutting down for a long time parts of city government's operations. And uh, if you're talking about critical urban infrastructure, we saw what happened uh, when part of the natural gas pipeline was attacked. Um, the business office was attacked in Colorado and the pipeline company shut down the East Coast pipeline for fear that somehow that ransomware attack on the operation of the business end of the company might be connected to somebody physically attacking the natural gas lines. Uh, the effect was uh, enormous and problematic. Uh, it's not even clear they needed to shut down the natural gas lines. And it's probable that in the future, some lessons will be learned from that particular attack. Um, my sense is that if there's some other set of considerations, then sure, you wouldn't just pay the ransom. But I don't know what those might uh, entail. So I can't make a general statement about that. Um, the cybersecurity assessment to help public entities understand their risks regarding data is an important step. Is there also a conversation about refactoring the request for proposal process? In my experience as a national managed security service provider, the RFP process is too rigid to keep pace with emerging threats. Um, I'm gonna uh, respond more generally uh, to that question and say, uh, there's a very elaborate audit that a private company would have to do if it wishes to work with the federal government, particularly with the Defense Department. And in that audit, which, as I say, is hugely elaborate, um, there's definitely a close look at the cybersecurity uh, attention and steps paid by anybody who wants to do that work with the federal government to a whole host of considerations about any information that they have flowing in or out and how that might provide a channel to the federal defense establishment. So in the federal context, the answer I think is yes, that there's much more scrutiny, much clearer standards, um, much more careful, continuous review of how someone who wants to work in a process that might involve RFP process with the federal government uh, guarantees that they're not providing an um, inadvertent channel for someone to get through them to the federal agency. Um, in normal negotiation, you often refer to your BATNA to assess your position and to analyze your situation. In cyber negotiation, is there a formal process for you to evaluate the alternatives or to develop an alternative during the attack? Um, during the attack, it's impossible to develop an alternative. You need to have done this beforehand. And in the same way, in general negotiation, we would argue there's preparation, 
then there's the opening stage of the negotiation then there's the distribution of gains and losses and the writing of an agreement and then there's the follow-through or compliance with the agreement negotiation we would say in general in uh, in preparation we would say in negotiation the first step is really important and i would argue um every city as part of its vulnerability assessment should look at its the risks of various assets that it has of being lost and it should look at what the cost would be of replacing those or what the damage would be of losing control of them um we have one city in massachusetts that was attacked and uh the ransom takers uh said uh you owe have to give us this much money or you won't get this data back and we'll release this list of uh where sexual offenders in your city are living if you don't pay us this ransom now hopefully someone had thought about that ahead of time or at least they will now and they won't have that information accessible through the same information systems that are uh, amenable to attack so your batna is what is your situation if you lose your most valuable assets and have to recreate them and have to live with the damage that that causes and that's the uh, reservation point from which you would decide whether to pay a ransom or whether to try to negotiate for a, a lower ransom uh, next question is um, law is a very important part when it comes to order and protection whether it is for humans things or in the digital realm so within the topic of this presentation how do you follow the applicable laws how do you decide which laws and rules are applicable and how do you deal with international issues when different legal instruments need to be um, construed in different ways to apply the presented management solutions and ideas for critical infrastructure protection okay a, a bunch of questions um there are no laws in the united states regarding cybersecurity and uh how the state how standards must be set or met there are no state laws there are no local laws there's no federal law about what has to be done uh, by private actors other than there than those who want, wish to work with the federal defense with the defense department or other federal agencies there are rules that they have to meet um the new the current administration says now finally we're going to have some laws uh at the federal level and there's an office in the White House that has been created in the last couple of years, and it's in the process of trying to formulate laws. And the question is, will they say that all 50 states have to have laws? Will the states be able to have different laws? Will there be one set of laws for the whole federal gov for the federal government? Uh, not clear yet. So the law hasn't really come into play. In the medical world, we have established through case law i'm not an attorney but i know we've established through case law a standard of care so if a hospital doesn't meet prevailing standards of care and somebody dies their uh, family can bring a lawsuit and say you didn't meet the prevailing standard of care we don't have case law yet in the u.s establishing a standard of care that a private company or a public agency has to meet in order to be protected from a lawsuit from someone who's been hurt uh, i i think it's urgent that we have laws federal and state laws i think it's urgent that we think about ways of implementing them but as yet we don't have that um again i'm looking at more of these questions 
Can we recognize some signs that a cyber attack is coming? That's a great question. Um, if we had a mandatory rule, if we had a rule and a mandate to report, then any city would have to report within 12 hours that it was attacked. The agency that got those reports could put out to every city in town a statement that says, these guys have just been attacked via this route. They've just been asked to pay this kind of uh, um, ransom. And the, the sign would be an attack in some places being a forewarning that the same attack could come to many other places. If we have no requirement to report, then we don't get the advantage of those signs. As it is, the FBI tries to put out every few months some kind of case summary uh, without saying who they're talking about because places, cities are very sensitive about word getting out that uh, they were attacked. One, because they think that increases their chances of being attacked again. My view is that all depends on what they do. Um, but the other is uh, politically not a, a great story that somehow you didn't do enough and you were attacked. Uh, but the signs all depend on information being shared. And at the present time, it's not. Uh, are there any good resources for doing internal phishing vulnerability testing? Yes, lots. Um, I, there are all kinds of vendors who provide phishing vulnerability testing that any any not-for-profit, for-profit, big, small company, public agency could immediately acquire and use. Um, since you mentioned the amounts of ransom asked are increasing, I won't say exponentially, but substantially, don't you think that there's a bigger room for negotiation there? Isn't the negotiation training becoming more necessary? Um, first, the city would have to decide who has responsibility during an attack to negotiate. Most places don't have an incident response plan with clear lines of authority, and they it's urgent that they create that. It's possible that we could offer some training. We, the collective group listening to this, we could offer some training uh, for all the people who are responsible who would actually be doing this. Or we would, could, could say, here's the list of private companies and their 24-hour uh, uh, contact information and call them and they'll take over for you and they know how to handle this. Um, whether the increasing amount of the ransom request means there's more room to negotiate my sense is probably not, because uh, the hackers uh, want to do everything they can not to be found. And they run a risk if they have a second round of interaction uh, with the target uh, that somebody might find a way to get back to them. So uh, I agree that there should be more learning about for the one responsible in each place. Uh, with regard to how to handle this uh, possible negotiation, it may be smarter for there to be just a, like a small set of regional centers in the U.S. or a small set of companies that are worldwide that on a moment's notice can step in, take over, and uh, help the agency that's been attacked, which probably has no expertise. And having one course in negotiation doesn't equal expertise in how to handle uh, cyber attacks. Um, do the dynamics change if the cyber attacks spill over into the physical world, such uh, as disrupting water treatment or gas distribution? Um, I prepared a, a series of short videos on the best known attacks in the US um, using public coverage of what happened during those attacks um, and the uh, the attack on the East Coast natural gas line is one of the cases. Another is the attack in Florida on the water treatment facility that happened the day of the Super Bowl uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, this seemed to be an attack on a physical system 
And it wasn't clear that they were asking for ransom. Somebody was attacking the system uh, with the perverse goal of putting poison or chemicals that would turn into poison if they were used not for cleaning up the water, but for contaminating the water at a higher uh, and, uh, level of uh, chemical introduction. Um, so the dynamic could change if somebody's not seeking ransom, just seeking to attack. And that then, there's less, even less likelihood of being able to negotiate. And uh, I, it's just, the only thing I can argue is for those facilities that might be attacked without the ability to buy their way out of the attack by paying a ransom, they really need to invest in preparation. Not preparation to negotiate, preparation to reduce their vulnerability to attack. Everything should be focused on doing all the things you can do so that the social engineering maneuvers of the attackers, i.e. phishing and some other things, uh, won't work. An agency is only as well off as the least well-trained person in that agency is inclined to open an unknown or dangerous email. That's all they have to do is open that email and release that ransomware. So uh, I'm not sure um, that the actual um, hostage-like negotiation is different when the attack is on a physical system. Uh, when it's on the physical system and people are going to die unless you can get the attack to stop, uh, it's, it's not about negotiation. Uh, in many instances, it's going to be too late. This should be the argument for laws requiring a minimum standard of care to be met. This should be an argument for uh, stockholders to say to every company and citizens to say to every city, have you done everything you can and should do to try to reduce our risk? Um, I see Nicole uh, basically about to tell me. That's uh, the sign that we have time, I think, for one more question, Larry. <laughs> um, uh, presentation slides. Um, as you noticed, I really didn't do much except have some questions. Um, uh, so on the, no, there are no slides, but I'm going to go through the rest of the questions and I'm going to literally write out short responses and we're going to uh, post those. Uh, Nicole will say again exactly how you'll find that. Um, but no, I, I don't have slides, but I am going to post uh, two links to two articles. Um, uh, there we go. Uh, and links to two websites. The urbancyberdefense.mit.edu tells you all about the research being done by the clinic. And it has uh, blog entries on all kinds of subjects. And if you are uh, an academic and you want to think about, oh, I'd like to have my students get involved in this. Uh, cybersecurityclinics.org is the consortium. Uh, we meet once a month online. Everyone is invited who might want to help to organize a clinic on their campus. Uh, you join, there's no fee. Uh, you have access to the videos and other teaching materials for free uh, via that website that I was describing. And the two readings uh, will give you uh, written documentation of probably more than half of the points that I made in passing. So uh, we'll leave these up or make sure people can come back to those. Great, thank you so much, Larry. Really appreciate it, very informative discussion. And thanks to all the participants, especially for the really the high quality of questions in the Q&A. Um, as uh, Larry mentioned, he will uh, respond to the remaining questions. They will be put back up on the events page, the same one that you visited uh, for uh, this discussion, as well as the recording and video of this entire presentation so that you can share it uh, or revisit it if you need to. 
As you know, PON uh, is always hosting a variety of events. We've got two more before our winter break next week. Max Bazerman of Harvard Business School uh, will be with us uh, for his new book, Complicit. And then Rachel Viscomi uh, of the law school uh, will be talking about facilitative dialogue. Uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, at those events or at one of our uh, virtual or in-person trainings, Negotiation and Leadership, our three or four day programs in April, May, and June, or any of our virtual programs, one days, two days, uh, or other. So thank you to everyone for being here. We wish you all well, and a big thanks to Professor Larry Suskind for his informative presentation. Have a great rest of your day, everybody.